for hearing your tunes, Kevin. <laughs> if you have music or something, it's looping back through your mic. It's coming through his meter, though. Greetings, Tony Mobley here, and we're back with another episode of Conversations with Tony Mobley. And I'm so happy you can be here with me tonight on this historic occasion. Why do I say it's a historic occasion? Because we have some creators of, 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 of history that they're going to share with us tonight on how they are making a difference in the lives of our most powerful resource, children. How they are producing productions that are shared in schools. But before I introduce you to them, let me just share with you this. Why are we here? We're here because life has provided me with real opportunity to have real conversations with real people. So that is why we're here. And this is what we try to do. I need your help though. I need you to ask questions in the YouTube chat. I also need you to ask questions in the conversation with Tony Mobley Mukama chat in the Zoom webinar. And if you like this and past conversations, I need you to like, 
subscribe, set the bell to all the notifications to remind you of all the upcoming conversations. So I ask that you do that for me. So tonight, my very special guests are the creators of the Flying Hobos. That's right, you heard me, the Flying Hobos. So we have Louisa Jagger, Kevin Mambo, and Lamar Cheston. And they are, they are artisans. They are musicians. They are writers. They are actors. They are creators who have given us the flying hobos. And so we're going to allow them to introduce themselves. And then we are going to get started with our questions for this exciting group. First, we're going to ask Louisa to introduce herself to us. Thank you, Louisa. I am Louisa Jagger, and I'm the founder, one of the founders of Greatest Stories Never Told, where we look to find stories of minorities and women in STEM fields. So people who've been doing science and got overlooked just because no one wrote it down in mainstream papers. Trust me, there were lots of newspapers that were writing about them. They were typically African-American newspapers and they were celebrated in that community, but they never made it to our textbooks. So this is something we never learned about in school and that our children now aren't learning about for the most part. And that's what we're here to do is to change that, to show them these stories and make sure they know the real history, not revised, the actual history of America. Thank you, Louisa. Kevin. I met Louisa when I was working on a production of Lynn Nottage's Sweat in Pittsburgh. And it was at a time when they were taking Flying Hobos and wanted to sort of open it, expand it, turn it into something bigger. And I came on board after that production to come on uh, to help Louisa co-write and direct started working with Lamar on this and to compose. We have music in the show as well for the kids. And uh, the idea was to really bring the, the intentions of these gentlemen together as human beings, as opposed to, you know, oftentimes when we're looking at historical work, biographical work, there's always, particularly uh, in the live field, I won't say necessarily on screen, uh, an, an element of almost walking into a museum and seeing people perform in front of a fresco, in front of a particular exhibit. And I wanted to, for us to really find a place to make these, these guys natural. So when we have audiences, they see themselves, they see their uncles, their brothers, their fathers, et cetera. They see real people engaged in real struggle and, and they want to come along on this ride and see it through to sort of their victory. So that was the real main focus was to really work on, on having something that was really engaging. Thank you, Kevin. Lamar. Greetings family. My name is Lamar K. Cheston, uh, New York City. I've uh, been working with Greatest Stories Never Told and Louisa and Pat since about, I believe, 2014 or 15, I was doing an off-Broadway play, Black Angels over Tuskegee, that, as, as you mentioned earlier, about the, uh, you know, Tuskegee Airmen. It's, it's a lot of things happening with them right now. I, I mean, another Black man going, it's, it's so many things happening right now. So, you know, when this, when I was approached with this opportunity, it was a no-brainer, you know, and um, I didn't know, honestly, going into it, I didn't know much about James Herman Banning or Thomas Cox Allen but through the process and through learning and the revisions of the show and just seeing the reactions, the, the visceral reactions right after the show of people who didn't know about our stories. I feel like a part of my calling is to continue to tell our history through my art. So I'll continue to do as much as I can to help push the show forward because it needs, it needs to be told. The story of these two men need to be told. Thank you, Lamar, so much. Yes, sir. I want to thank all three of you so much for being here tonight. And we hope that 
the audience gleans a lot of good information from what you're going to share tonight. And also, we want to encourage them to go to your website, flyinghobos.com. Is that right? It's actually greateststoriesnevertold.org. Greateststoriesnevertold.org. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Okay, so um, we want to go ahead and introduce the rest of the panel. And we have Dr. Chris Clark with us tonight, who's going to do the questions. And so Dr. Clark, please uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, Tony. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Chris Clark. I live in uh, Tempe, Arizona. I'm a retired professor and a former submarine officer and jazz drummer. But I didn't do any of those things at the same time. They were gaps and, and uh, it was more of a parallel than a series system. Anyway, I'm honored to be here and looking forward to reading the questions and most importantly, looking forward to learning more about greatest stories never told and uh, getting my grandchildren lined up to draw on the beautiful work that Louisa and Kevin and Lamar have pulled together. End of introduction. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Tlaloc Lopez Waterman. I'm Tlaloc Lopez Waterman, and um, I had the great pleasure to work with Lamar, uh, Louisa, and Kevin on The Flying Hobos when it had its virtual debut. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more about, um, about how that happened and why that happened. And we will also uh, talk a little bit about what it was before that. But um, for me, the f greatest stories never told says it all. It is exactly what this is about, is bringing to the forefront of our, our current existence, the understanding that we do not have the full story. We have not been given the truth about how history works. And so we need to work on that as a collective society. And these beautiful people here are doing just that. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Andy. Hey, everybody. I'm Andy Carluccio over in the Washington, D.C. area. And I had the great pleasure of being introduced to GSNT through Kevin, who I'd been working on with a couple of theatrical projects for a while. And uh, my company got to work with uh, Greatest Stories Never Told on the uh, virtual debut of Flying Hobos, which was a lot of fun to think about all the nuts and bolts of that and how it came together. And what a great cause, as, as the other panelists have said. I mean, there couldn't be a better use for this platform and to be able to disseminate this to young people who are going to be able to carry that forward. And of course, I'll, I'll let the experts share about how important that mission is. But I'm so glad to be here tonight with all of you. Thank you, Andy. So we're gonna start with a few questions of my own, and then we'll go to, to Chris and we'll get some, some questions from, from Okana. So my first question tonight is, how has technology informed your productions? Well, actually when COVID hit, it all shut down. We had almost a fully booked February and everything got canceled. And there was no way to change that. And then suddenly Kevin was working on some virtual plays with different, different theaters. And we got a grant that allowed us to buy the equipment we needed so we could actually take it virtual. And one of our first productions took it to over 100,000 kids um, through the Ohio it's the um, Center for Science out of um, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. And that was, was incredibly I? exciting because, but our big job was how do we make it interactive? How do we get the kids to interact on screen? How do we get them to turn on their cameras? And it turns out the easiest thing in the world, give them credit. If they get credit, then <laughs> it was a teacher told us this. We were saying, what are we going to do? And they were saying, we'll just give them credit. And they all turned on their cameras. We had their very first production. People didn't turn them on. And from then on out, everybody did. And they, they interacted because the actors, Lamar and um, 
it was so, he's so engaging, all the actors are engaging, but they get the kids to talk and answer and they ask questions and there are problems to solve. They're trying to figure out how much gas it's gonna to take to get from one place to the other. And they, they actually are measuring things on a map that somehow Talilak managed to get on screen and we shrunk Lamar. So he's standing on top of a ruler and the kids loved it. It's just, it's an exciting way for us, the interaction was the interaction with the technology, it had to happen. And that is one of the biggest challenges. And making that occur was for us just an amazing feat and very exciting to see the kids get so engaged. Very, very, very cool. Uh, does anybody want to add to that? Okay. Lamar. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, just, just, I guess from, the the other side of it all you know it's i feel like every day was was tech day you know because it, it, we we have lines we have we have uh interactions we like like Louisa said we do with the with the audience uh and and then of course if you if i say a joke and there's a delay who you don't know if it's funny so you don't know if you're getting you know that <laughs> reaction back from the audience it's, it's it's things like that but it was it, it it really took a lot more time technically to I mean I remember being in uh in Kevin's apartment and it was I mean the floor was littered with wires two really big I mean I know Talala could get into it probably later but like two really big green screens and just uh, she she uh she talked about the map if I didn't point at the right place then I would be pointing at California instead of New Mexico or something like that you know so those little technicalities really we really had to pay attention to that if we had if we were doing on a, on a stage we wouldn't have to worry about those things you know Sure, Kevin, go ahead. I think as well, you being um, artistically being forced uh, for all of us to pivot at the same time created really an environment for some of these things to take off and for us to really look at what works and what doesn't, improve the workflow, improve the writing, improve the technology and sort of, you know, there's no, there was no one surge in one particular piece of this artistry. Everything kind of happened at the same time. And it um, sort of became paramount for all the pieces to come together. I think that's the, the real one thing that we've gained from this. We are unfortunately not going to get rid of um, variant. So we are going to be opening and closing and opening and closing in different capacities or, you know, opening venues in different ways. We have, we're going to have to start to reinvent what that's going to look like. But at the same time, I think there is going to continue to be a drive to perfect what this looks like because um, it will always continue to be a very viable option. The better it gets and the more we understand how to use this tool effectively, I think. Thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, let's see, the next question is going to be, what has been the responses from schools on the productions? I'm going to let Kevin answer that because he's got a couple of things I know he can say. I remember particularly the addition of our having music in our show and uh, sections in the music for chants, sing-alongs, actual direct engagement is always a, such an uplifting and disarming tool in terms of communication. And I remember after one of the songs and talking about I don't remember exactly where we were in the script, but I think it might have been one of the times when the plane came down and, you know, we didn't have any money to go on. And I'm telling this story intently, you know, into fifth and sixth graders. And I stop and this girl in the front row looked up at me and whispered to me, and what happened next? And I really realized how engaged this gym full of kids were. I mean, if you actually give them some credit at, in, in terms of being intelligent, they will suspend that disbelief and come with you anywhere you ask them to go. And it was a real, um, it was a real lesson in terms of really treating your audience with respect at all times. 
we didn't need much more than a song and a microphone and a story. And suddenly it was 800 people standing together on the head of a pin waiting to see what the next thing is. So as I was saying, I was saying earlier in another interview, as human beings, it is necessary for us to have social event, be it the theater, be it music, be it a sports event, be it church, be it uh, a march, be it a symposium, be it an elective 100 level class in an amphitheater. We actually thrive by coming together in an exponential way. So trying to create an environment digitally that actually does bring us together, I think that's that's kind of a gift. And I have to really give a lot of props to Talalak and, and Andy and, and the rest of their crew and their patients in terms of really <laughs> doing, but really in terms of really coming up against something new and doing the problem solving. I mean, you don't know till you get there, but I do say that the best artists that I have ever worked with are the ones that get to a place and say, I don't know. And then you figure out when you're on the precipice how to come up with something that's new. So that's really what I've come away with on this. It's a lot. So the conversation that we all had to have is that the intimacy that Kevin was just talking about in the show was in the room and was eye to eye, person to person, low latency interaction and communication. And, and so as we iterated the, the show, we were talking about, did we keep it intimate or not? And that's a huge question. When you start to do these things, in the in, in the way that we do them, you know, in vir, in the virtual theater genre, which I think is now a genre, it's a question. You know, are we still being intimate, or is it intimacy just because it's a it's a screen? It needs to be really intimate. It needs to be really connected, and so we had to have those conversations, because what what are we doing? We're we're telling a story about two 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 historical figures, but we're doing it with really engaging human beings. And, and what, what was hard, and Louisa touched on this already, was to make sure that there was the energy going both directions. And sometimes we got it, sometimes we didn't. We talked about it, we rethought things, and we did it again, and it was a little better the next time. Thank you. Chris, do we have some questions? Oh, Louisa's got her hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Louisa. That's okay. Go ahead. I can say that we perform virtually for Bowie State University. And I think, Lamar, you remember this very clearly. Some of the people cried afterwards. They couldn't believe that this story about the first two African Americans to fly from one coast to the other, they didn't know about. And this is a historically black college and university. It's, they, they couldn't believe that they didn't know the story and then they couldn't believe how well the story was being told and the beauty of it. And we were still working out all the technical difficulties. They knew that when we brought them aboard to help work with us, but they cried and then we all cried. <laughs> it, it was a really incredibly moving experience to see them take in the story, but they didn't just take it in intellectually, they took it in emotionally. It became part of who they are. Yes, Lamar. And 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 to speak to the you know she said the the kids in terms of how they took it in intellectually it, it's it's amazing to see because we do we we have like mathematical equations that I do with them on you know when we interact during the show and I mean these kids are so smart so spot on I'm giving them multiplication problems uh, addition problems subtraction on the spot division. And, they, and they're coming up with these answers on the spot. And it's amazing to see their minds work. And that's the engagement part that no matter what is going on technically, that engagement, that one-on-one, I know they'll never forget, you know, because they're, they're, the wheels are turning as, as I'm learning, as they're listening. And then we have like, you know, call and response things. They, they, they bring those up to us after the show. It's, it's really fun to, to see and watch them learn, you know, on the spot, man, it, it's just it's just an amazing thing to see from from 
kindergarten to college. We've done them all. So it's, it's really good to see. Well, I want to say again, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I think there are a lot of us who have not heard the story. And that's why we wanted to have this conversation tonight so that others may get an opportunity to hear this story because it's an important story. And I know that um, one of my uh, one of my questions and not, I'm not going to you know go to it right now, but it is an uh, it is around other other historical figures who whose stories need to be told. And the one I want to lift up is uh, Shirley um, uh, Jackson. And uh, Dr. Clark shared her uh, her story with me earlier today, and she is a um, she is a scientist who um, we we have to think of fiber, internet fiber, fiber how it's being used for the internet. We need to thank her for that. And you know this is this is someone that's you know also in our own um, era that we can, you know, we can celebrate and, and her story can be told. Um, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, that we had not heard the story of these two men before, but it is a celebration that you guys have the opportunity to share it with us. So again, I want to say thank you. Dr. Clark, do we have some questions? Yes, we do. The All first right. question, the first question comes in from Andy Carluccio in the Washington, D.C. area. And Andy asks, how does engagement with your student audience inform the way you have staged flying hobos? It's everything. Our engagement with these with the students, engaging them is everything because what they've learned from studies is that an emotional connection to something heightens learning. So if you emotionally feel it at the same time you're learning it, you remember it forever. I know everyone in this audience, everyone here today has that moment where they learned about something important that really moved them and they've never forgotten it. And so for us connecting emotionally with the students, helping them feel it to become a part of it, and that is something the actors do. It's just amazing how they can reach through technology through a screen and make that happen. So for us, it is everything. Go ahead, Kevin. One of the things we worked on when I came on board, um, which speaks really to this, was we uh, in the original version of the script, you know, you have particularly with historical pieces that are plays and not on screen. On screen, you can create montages, music, you can make all kinds of commentary with images and create context. On stage, you have to really create uh, the context yourself. And what we bump up against a lot in historical pieces, particularly with very few characters is creating a balance between a human being, but also making sure that the, that the context and exposition and information is in place so that these people have a place, right? But the more you have exposition, the more you're sort of sliding away from an actual human experience. We don't speak in exposition. So what we did was we created a third character who is our narrator, who is our guide through this, but also takes on other characters in the show that these two men um, encounter on this journey and that freed both actors to really come at their work from a completely human perspective and not have to worry that the exposition or this fact or that was not going to be the other and, and the children really respond to two men trying to solve their own internal conflict for the for the bigger goal. So, you know, I think that marrying those things in the technology with, you know, it, it's usually product and then our tech or lighting or sound or whatever now comes to help couch that experience. And in terms of um, a much more technological approach, 
you kind of have to give that creature in the room a lot more breathing space. And instead of now having one or two divisions in the work, there's now a third chamber in the work that also commands its own space and its own respect and will in the end, depending on how you're working, will start to influence the art that came before it. So it's exciting because it's actually really in a lot of ways a new thing. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Louisa. Next question. Lalak Lopez Waterman from Astoria, New York asks, who are the flying hobos? Flying Hobos were the first two. Well, James Herman, Brown, James Herman Banning is one of the most fabulous characters I've ever learned about. We have piles of information that we have dug up on him. And he was the first African-American to fly across the United States. And that's exciting because he went across the United States in an engine with a 14-year-old engine of an Eagle Rock and stopped town to town to raise enough funds to get to the next place. But I think that that's just part of his story because he had to build his own airplane to get his flight hours, to get his license. And how many people would actually build their own car to be able to drive a car? I know I wouldn't do it. I mean, this was a man that was more determined to do this than, the, than most human beings are ever determined to do anything. He was going to make this happen. He was going to fly. And he didn't care how long he had to look. He was turned down from a ton of flight schools. And he finally found Fisher, who was an army captain, who, an army lieutenant, I'm sorry, who had flown. And he had opened up his own flight school. And he told Banning he would teach him on the fly. And he did. He taught him how to fly. And then he crashed before Banning had his solo hours. So now Banning has no airplane. He has no way to get there. And he built, with the help of his flying friends, his first airplane. For every single thing we found out about him opened up the doors to this admiration and respect. And then Thomas Cox Allen comes along and we start learning about him. And, and he had an incredible story too, because he was going to fly no matter what. And these two men didn't even like each other. They really, in the beginning, despised each other. And what happened is they cared so much through the African-American newspapers, an entire country and all those communities with them on their journey and everybody who gave them, even if it was a meal or gas money, they got to sign the wing of their plane and they called that the gold book. So people really were flying with them. Fantastic. Yes, Lamar. Oh, and just to, uh, just to touch on uh, something that Luisa said about them not not liking each other, basically working together, you know, working through the issues. Now, I remember during the the rehearsal process for uh, this the this production, and we were working with Kevin because he was helping us with a lot of direction, and we really wanted to show that tension, ramp up that tension between the two because that's a lot of what in the end we want to tie into with the with the children. You can work through your issues with someone to still achieve greatness. So we had to, I, I remember specifically, and now it's a different medium. So we're trying to convey this message to the kids through the camera instead of being you know, up close and personal with them. So I remember taking a little bit of time and working on that with Kevin and Talalik and Drew, who, all, who plays uh, James Herman Banning. And th that, that was the difference as well. But it, it, when we found it, it worked. You know? And, now, and that, that's, that's all it is in this, I guess, in this virtual space. It's just trial and error. And once you find it, remember it. <laughs> and then, you know, it'll, it'll continue to work because you put the work in to get there, you know. Fantastic. Thank you, Lamar. Next question. Our next question comes from Andy Carluccio, who asks, what has been the best benefit of performing your work virtually through Zoom? Uh, a real quick answer for me was, I mean, being able to affect hundreds, thousands of people like that, you know, I mean, we, we before the, we had to perform the, uh, this piece in a Zoom space, we were, we were literally traveling. We went, we've been to 
uh, we, I know we were in Ohio, Iowa, we were uh, Virginia. We, we've been so many places with this, but now we have to, we want to be able to affect, and we found a way to affect the masses with this same message, you know, just through a different lens. So being able to affect them at the, you know, the push of a button, you know, just go live, that, that, that's amazing. Fantastic. And we are also in an age too where uh, the screen is part of our lives. And that's not, and that will continue to increase. It's just a part of our lives. And one can judge that or not judge that, but it's, it is a fact that we'll continue to, and we will continue to get closer to our technology and we will continue to get closer to our technology to find ways to get closer to each other. I mean, that has always been the, the, the general arc, I mean, that I remember since the seventies and I think that that still remains true. So being able to, I, I've done a couple of um, film projects as well in the last, year that have been done in oculus vr and as a character in oculus vr depending on how you answer me within the experience you'll get different answers from me and if it's a if, if there are clues to be solved you can look around in three dimensions and find clues in the room and so the experiences are again we are finding ways to get it closer and closer and closer and closer and more and more natural so i i only see really an expansion of this media, it, working on this show. And I think at the same time, two other shows, I was doing a Caribbean arts festival and another one, by the time I sort of tallied it up, I was like, we, I just finished with 750,000 audience members in the last three days. So the reach is phenomenal. And so it really, really depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it. The reach will continue to expand, but I think it will probably make people much more conscious of what it is that they're putting out. Kevin, just for, can you repeat that number again, please? Okay. <laughs> 750,000. 750,000 people in three days. Wow. And that is wow. And that is not a movie, right, or television. That's us as a live team. It's, it is a live team as it is in the theater. We are all, all of us backstage together, spinning plates, making it. It is exactly the same principles, but with an entirely new set of tools. I mean, I particularly, I like it particularly because I believe it gives us some of the flexibility that we didn't have in the theater in terms of adding sound, lighting, in terms of adding different backgrounds. You were not in the round and you're not in front of me, but I think there is a way to give the medium its own respect in its own space and develop it in its own way and not try to make it be live theater, make it be or allow it to be its own thing. And so we're sort of at the cusp of discovering what that is. So that's, that is exciting. That's one thing I've really enjoyed about doing. And I, and I said yes to every single project last year because of it, because it was, I was just clawing and learning uh, with different people and, and different projects and different systems and different approaches and what worked and what didn't. And just all of that, you know, I think it was a large, it was a large uh, amount for people to absorb in, in terms of what we're doing, all of us together. And some people have managed to kind of, keep on and catch up. And some people are still kind of trying to, you know, to catch up, but it's its own thing. And I think it needs to be respected as that. I, I think Kevin, that it must still be a secret because anybody who's doing any serious uh, theater work or video production work, um, the reach of 750,000 people in three days why would you not want to take a look at that medium to see if that's something that could be useful for other projects? But some people still have a hard time sending email. I mean, I've been, I, I started programming TRS 80s and Commodore 64s when I was a kid, but I still, as Andy and Talalik will tell you, still make 
routinely dumb technological errors. So I, I, so I can't imagine for someone who is, um, I would even say savvy, but someone who is not even tech friendly, tech phobic, let's say, to be able to try to translate what they know organically and try to hybridize that with something new to get something new. It's a tertiary product at that point, I think, because A is now fused with B to get C. It's not using B to get back to A, right? It's a it's a new thing. So if you're if you're phobic about these things, it, because you're going to be running it from your house yourself, we don't have people to be in the house with you to you know, and oftentimes it's about I got to figure out where my signal path is, or I didn't pl I did everything except plug this one thing in, or the connection was. I mean, there's a million you know troubleshooting issues that go on but if you're you know phobic about that stuff you probably will shy away from wanting to get in waiting in the water and not being as good as and as good as go ahead Talalak. i mean i think that that you, you bring up an amazing point and that is that when when we do this we're we're reaching into people's homes you know and and it's it's like here here's a giant kit with a green screen and stands and you know um, uh, cameras and 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 cables and and oh and by the way how are you hooked to your internet can I disconnect your router that router is no good I'll use this router instead well now my wife doesn't have Wi-Fi you know I mean it's it it's kind of a mess in one regard it's it's difficult you know the amount of money that has been put into making studios, into making theaters, into making performance spaces is a lot. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out a way for not very much money to make studios out of people's homes. And, and it's difficult, it's hard, it's not easy. And we have to kind of push and you, you should have heard the conversations that I've had with Lamar. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> and trying to get that stuff to happen. <laughs> oh, gosh. I love you, man. It's all love, baby. <laughs> but no, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's just very, uh, whatever he said is it, true, man, <laughs> for sure. Like, I mean, it, it, it's just, it was just a new space. It was just a new space to, to navigate, man. But, um, and it really takes a team effort. Like, I mean, I, I've never heard of, I think we were using something called comms. It, 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 it's, I, we downloaded apps and I'm looking at, I feel like I was looking at frequencies and we, it, it was just, it, I, we needed each other. It really made us depend on each other to get it done. But once we got it done, as Louisa talked about earlier, the tears were there because the story was told and we affected people and we knew that we told the story the right way on all, you know, on all levels, at least the, the best way we could, you know, at this point in the process. Fantastic. Fantastic. Chris, we have another question. Yes, we do. All this right. comes from Tlaloc Lopez Waterman. What is the most surprising thing that you have learned by embarking on telling the greatest stories never told? I bet that everybody has something really surprising that they can say, but for me, it was the intense lack of knowledge that we teach our children from the very beginning. You know, we teach them about the founding fathers, but we don't teach them about um, the, there are so many people who helped shape America and build America who weren't white and who weren't, and who were women and who were minorities. And that lack for me was completely stunning. When we really started studying open heart surgery, an African-American, traffic lights, an African-American, the first in the Arctic, an African-American. We don't know this because we aren't told this. Um, the first African-American woman to fly had to learn French in order to go to France to get her license. We're not told that in school. And that for me was completely shocking. I have African-American grandchildren and this journey started because I went to go get books for them about scientists. I'd worked at the Smithsonian, worked with, I wanted them to be able to embrace science if that's what they decided they wanted to do. And I found Banneker, I found 
a couple other people, but they're just, they weren't there. The books weren't there. And then when I started looking through the historical black newspapers and there were lists and lists and lists of people doing exciting things, it, it amazed me that this could actually be what was happening. And Pat and I made a decision that we were gonna change that. And we were lucky enough to run into John T. Oreo and Lamar Cheston, who agreed to help us on this journey to put, we did a whole series of living history videos about Banning's journey. And those can be found on jhbanning.com. But these kind of things, I mean, we were just like, will you help us tell the story? These are amazing stories. And, and the answer was yes. And they did, they helped shape it. And then Kevin came along and shaped it even more. And now we're gonna be telling more stories. We wanna tell about Henry Box Brown who mailed himself to freedom in a box as Lamar knows because he's working on the play, they're writing it. It's, he mailed himself in a box to freedom and became one of the great abolitionists. You know, Bessie Coleman, the first woman African-American to get her license, who inspired an entire generation, who was a barnstormer, who she was just incredibly driven and was gonna do it no matter how she had to do it. Um, these are the stories that aren't in our history books. They're not embedded in our culture. They have a paragraph about somebody and that's it. But we want them to be embedded and threaded through our culture, the way our culture really was developed, what really happened. So yeah, that was an incredibly shocking surprise to me and it changed the way I look at life and it changed the direction of my life and what I wanted to do with it. Mar, did you have your hand up? Yeah, you know, the the one one of the greatest things I love about just working with greatest stories never told is that I'm even though I am an artist and I through the art we are teaching, I learn all the time. You know, we I remember uh when we were first starting the process, Louisa and Pat, uh Pat Smith, another dear, dear friend to this project, create co-creator of Greatest Stories Never Told. Um, they gave us a binder. Now the binder had to be about, I don't know if you can approximate, but the binder, the binder was really big. And this, this was a binder for you on Allen, a binder for you on Banning, because the, their history is so rich and it's so like, I can go into that binder now and just continue to learn my history, you know, just because they've done that work and they found all of this information and I feel like it is my duty to learn it, be able to process it as much as I can and then disseminate it to the younger, the younger generation who's coming up. So always learning is what I love about this because Luis or, or, or Pat, they always have a little nugget that they didn't tell. They didn't tell us about Banning or about Allen. They'll throw it in right before a show and then they'll be like, oh man, how could I work that in there? You know, so it's an it's, it's, it's a, a ongoing process, but one, like I said, I'm always learning through. Very powerful. Very cool. Thank you, guys. Talak, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, I was um, I was really shocked. You know, I, I am not a pilot, but I have always been wished that I could be. And so I've looked a lot at the aviation community uh, over the years, and I felt like it, it was very um, it was a very it's a very tight knit community that helps each other and so it was really shocking to me when I learned about this story of, of, of these, of these um, two men flying into New Mexico, which is essentially a land where there's nothing in order to get to a place where they, they would be accepted. And, you know, the fact that they had to fly in a place, you know, that it just, it, it's unheard of in aviation now to make a choice like that, that would be actually more dangerous. And so it, it put into my brain an understanding that I never had before about what someone would have to go through when, you, when, when, you're, when they're um, preemptively have everything stacked against them. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a metaphor and not a metaphor. I mean, it's real, like it's a desert but also it's a metaphor because it's a desert. And if you think about 
what that means. And we should all learn from that. Thank you, sir, for that. Yes, Louise. I think one of the other things that happened, and I was talking to this with some kids recently, it changed my definition of a hero. Because if everything is handed to you and it's easy to get to, if you have tremendous talent and charisma and ability, that's great that you get to run for it. But when everything's stacked against you and to even get to that first place where you can try to follow your dream, when it's stacked against you to that degree, that's now my definition of a hero, whether they're male or female. It's, it's having everything stacked against you and figuring out a way around it, no matter what. That's a real hero. That's Lindbergh had money and he had wealth and he had so much going for him. And Banning had none of those things. And so it really did redefine what that meant for me. Chris. I love the way you mention heroism, Louisa. Um, when I was preparing for this conversation, reading about uh, what you had accomplished, um, the three of you, all of your whole team, uh, it, it rang a bell with uh, Joseph Campbell, who's written about the hero's journey. He studied the Odyssey and other heroic stories that come down as part of uh, Western culture. And these are essential building blocks for how we are to understand what heroism means and what it takes to move through various stages of uh, usually a life-threatening, uh, unsought heroic journey. And I wondered if as you, as you think about the whole the future of greatest stories never told, that perhaps what you're doing is creating a series of heroes' journey stories that feature African-American and other uh, underrepresented people in this, in this part of our culture, our consciousness. Not to put words in your mouth, but... No, no, that's something we've actually talked a great deal about is, is the hero's journey and who's gone on it and how we, who gets chosen to be one of the stories at first. There are so many stories we wanna tell, but um, Bessie Coleman is up to be one of the stories next, as is um, Henry Box Brown, as is Katie Payne, who was the first woman to find out that elephants communicate over long distances over infrasound, which is a sound that we didn't know that they were communicating with. It's how they all come to the same watering holes. And so it's what it takes as a woman for her to do that journey was incredibly difficult. Um, for Bessie Coleman, she had to go, as I said, she had to learn French, she had to raise the money, she had to have the courage to go over to a place by herself where she knew no one. So it's one of our bars is if it was really easy and everything was opened up, that's not our hero and we won't be choosing them. But if you're willing to put yourself in a box <laughs> and have someone seal it up with some holes in it and get somewhere, well, I think that's a hero's journey. And um, I'd be interested to hear Lamar and Kevin's opinions on those too. I know we've all talked about it. Mar, we can't hear you. Oh yes, yes. Oh yeah, you, you can hear me now. Oh yeah. So in in uh, in college, I did a uh, I did a, a production. I, I was. It's a story on Henry Box Brown, who who Louisa uh, referenced earlier, uh, mailed himself to freedom, and it was just. It was. It wasn't nothing. A story that I knew about. It was uh, Obama was coming. They were they were doing the uh, the debates. I went to Hofstra University uh, up in uh, in New York. So they were doing the, the the last debate in 2008, and we were trying to do some projects that were centered around uh, political issues or, or you know just political stories. And in my research, just wanting to do something that 
it, we could have had the first black president. I'm like, I mean, do something about a black man. And I stumbled upon Henry Box Brown. I wrote like a, I don't know, a, a script on him in a week. And I, we were able to perform these political uh, reenactments for the on the day of the debate that Obama came in 08. And then again, when they came back in, uh, in 2012. So, but I always wanted to expand the story. So now who knew that in 2014 or 15, I would meet Louisa and Pat and we would develop a story about James Herman Banning and Thomas Cox Allen. And then in just casual conversation, maybe while Talalik is fixing something technically, uh, Henry Box Brown comes up and then we, we didn't know we had that mutual connection. And now this is another story that, you know, we're going to collaborate on and, and make. So it's just, it's, it, there's so many stories. I mean, the, the name of the organization is the most fitting because these are some of the, literally the greatest stories never told and it's our duty to tell them. Fantastic. Kevin, did you want to say something? I think it is um, with any really captivating story, it is the journey of our hero slash our heroine that is most compelling. And with these stories, we find the same, a lot of the same ingredients, being able to find a way to persevere while bucking a system, facing pushback, but facing pushback while also attempting to climb into the unknown. And those are compelling and universal stories for all of us, regardless of time, age, sex, race, um, race, creed, wherever we're from, those are the stories that are about forward motion in, in the human experience. And so I, that's what I try to keep in the forefront of my lens when I'm working on sending stories like this. It's not just that these men were from here and that they did when we were working in terms of the writing I really tried like I said to humanize what their struggle was going to be in terms of facing odds of something that was most likely doomed to fail but being able to step out on faith in that way is for all of us I think the most compelling story wow thank you thank you all so much for that so I'm going, I'm going to uh, give one of my own questions right now. So I'm going to take license with you guys. Hope you don't mind. So my question, you are speaking to the world. What do you want them to know about these productions and why they are needed? Our stories, our stories of America, our stories of our world, we need to tell the real story because without that, we don't know what the truth is. And history is something that is always changing as we gather more information, as we learn more about Banning, as we learn more about Thomas Cox Allen, as we learn more about Bessie Coleman. These stories form a fabric of our world and that's incredibly important. Everybody needs to look out in the world and see someone who looks like them, who has done incredible things. And that's all of us. But the other thing is for me, the fact that these are all science-based is also crucial because we need to open up those windows, open those doors, make it easy for children to see themselves in those places and walk through those doors. When I was at the National Zoo, we were doing things with the reproductive physiologist who helped save endangered animals. And we had the kids draw pictures of scientists and they drew white men in lab coats with pocket protectors. And this isn't a school in Anacostia. And so then Bert Davis, who happens to be a very, he was the vet there, he's African-American. And Annie who, Donahue, who is a white female doing reproductive physiology went into there, they're both very attractive. They were wearing very modern clothes. They looked very cool. They told everything they were doing. And then three weeks later, these kids drew pictures again of scientists, but these scientists were dressed in the clothes that Annie and Bert were wearing. And these scientists 
look like the children. They drew themselves there. And that to me was proving to us, we can make changes in the way people see the paths if we open up these pathways. We can change lives if we open those doors. And that's our job. Our job is to try to change the world. Are we gonna change everything? No. Are we gonna make it perfect? No. But we can change some things and we need to be actively trying to do that in our best way possible. And our way is the arts and bringing science into the arts and bringing these stories into the arts. Thank you, Louisa. Lamar. Yeah, uh, I, and I mentioned earlier that I met I met Louisa through a, the, a play I was doing, uh, Black Angels over to Tuskegee, Oak Broadway. And, but the writer, he, the one thing I would say to answer your question, he wrote this and he said, history deserves the right to live. You know, and it's, it's, it's really simple. I mean, we, we, there shouldn't be a reason why our history is, is buried, why we should be ashamed of it. I know we know what we went through, but we also know that we do have heroes. But a lot of people don't know because it's not in the books that we read in school. It's not it's not in the 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 papers that, you know, that we frequent. But it is our job to do that. So history deserves the right to live. It's like once somebody comes to see our production, if a friend of theirs asks them, what did you do last night? Oh, I went and saw uh, uh, the flying hobos. Oh, what's that about? And that's how it continues. It's just a simple conversation. Oh, I never heard about that. And now that's how the history continues to live. Simple, casual conversation. But we have to make sure that it's there for people to come and experience. So that's what I would say. History deserves the right to live. As I'm older, I'm starting to turn into more of a history buff. Mm. And I'm finding, you know, my fascination is in the fact that, you know, history is told by the victor. And to be able to find other places, non-mainstream places for history allows me to have a greater understanding of the context of those events. And I think that that is kind of a crucial thing that we're missing. Somebody, we were, I was, uh, you were watching a show the other day and one of the characters says to, to someone else who's I think in, in their early thirties, you know, it's just like a, a Dick Cheney and the kid goes, you know, who's Dick Cheney? And to us, it's just such a short time ago that that was that Darth Vader was stirring the pot and creating all kinds of chaos. But without historical context and without understanding any of that, now you have, you know, a, a, a swath of American voters who have no problem with Putin affecting our elections. Meanwhile, if you have any kind of understanding of historical context, you would come back to McCarthyism and you would come back to all of the paranoia and the money spent on the Cold War. And now we treat, you know, Putin as some sort of casual friend. So our ability to tell these stories, I think, for me, really rests on, it's not just that these two men flew across the country, it's what is the context that they were living in? What is the world that they were presented with? And what is it that they had to overcome and again, overcome into the unknown to come to? That to me is really, you know, context is everything. Wow, thank, thank you all so much. T Talak, you're, you're shaking your head. Do you wanna to add to that? Um, well, I just agree uh, that um, context is so important and that it is very, very difficult for us to understand any, anything about the current moment if we don't take into consideration the context of not only ourselves, but others. And, um, and, and, then, and then you go back into, into the historical side of that, and it's super important that we, that we see and, 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 and there's, a, there's a, an important word in the name of the organization, and that's stories. And stories are what provide context. And so we need to tell stories, and, 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 and we need to be able to, to tell stories 
with integrity and with the intention of truth. Truth and fact are different things. And we've, we've pushed fact away a lot in this world, but we've also kind of pushed away truth. So what we need to do is combine fact, truth, and storytelling in order to really, really, really pull out what the actual experience of people are. And um, it, it, it's super important. Thank you for that. Thank you all so much for your, for your comments. Uh, Chris, do we have any more questions? We have two more questions on the board. Okay. The next one, the next one is from our friend Tlaloc Lopez Waterman. And he asks, how do you get the word out to the schools about the show? Um, we actually have worked pretty hard on that. We send once a year, well, we haven't yet for this year, but we send out a notification so schools know about us. But what we really ended up doing is schools have found out about us, organizations have found out, and then they contact us wanting to know how we can make that happen. Um, the, the NASA's space grant consortiums in each state, most of them have been very supportive of us going into a school and doing plays. The National Endowment for the Arts has supported us and hopefully will again. Um, so, but that's, you know, getting the word out is one of the most important ways to keep these stories going. So we're hoping you will share this with every school you know <laughs> and every organization as well, because I think that it is, people need to know that heroes come in every race, every color, every gender, every sexual orientation, they come in a multitude of ways. And, and when our kids are raised, knowing that from the very beginning, knowing that when they're two, three, four, five, six, that changes everything in their life from then on. Wow, okay. Kevin? Andy, leave me alone. I was just considering, <laughs> you know, going to schools as like a substitute phys ed teacher and just showing up on the day of the mustache and the headband and high socks and just go in and hand out flyers. But that's a lot of schools. It would be interesting to figure out what sort of digital networks and systems a lot of the education systems are on because I'm not currently in the education systems and figure out how we can, you know, cross into their into their bandwidth into their into their streams but i know there must be because you know this is our new learning medium as well as experience medium but it'd be interesting to see how to to cross into their stream somehow Marta, did you want to add to that um i mean the the school i, I feel like every school that we go to like they they tell another school about us and then we end up at, at that school. I, I, I know we just, we make, Louisa and Pat make such great connections and such great partnerships. And then we the, we go to these schools and they take us on like tours and they, they really give us the fabric of the school of, of, you know, they give us a history of it. They let us sit up, sit amongst the students at times, you know, like really soak in who we're, who we're about to go and perform for us. So I, I think that the relationships that we build with these schools and the relationships that these schools have just will always continue to keep the word out there. If nothing else, somebody will tell somebody else that we're coming, you know, because, you know, I think every every principal, every dean, they, they just want this to be a part of the curriculum, even if it's for a one month of the year, which a lot of times it is. Uh, I, I wanted to, to ask you guys, uh, how, how can we help? How can we help get your message out? I think it goes back to what Kevin was saying. Are there ways and mediums in which we can utilize so that more schools and more organizations know we're there? We're, you know, we're sort of new to using those particular routes and we would love to know how to do that in a way that's more effective. I think that would be great. Okay, Chris, the last question that you have. Final question on my list is also from Tlaloc, and it asks, who is Betsy, Bessie Coleman? She is 
she was the first African-American female who, who actually flew over to France to get her license and came back to America to show that, that African-Americans could take to the sky. And she absolutely, they wanted to do a film about her. Um, this is some new information I just found out. We have some information that her mother wrote about her that her niece has shared with us that has not been shared with the public. But we know that she actually was invited to do a movie. People were very excited about it. And then she goes onto the set and they want her to be in tatters. Well, she wasn't raised in tatters. She wasn't raised in ripped up poor clothes. And she said, I'm not doing this for you. I'm not doing this story that isn't my real story and walked off set. And because of that, she had a lot of pushback and a lot of anger. No one would have her in another film again and she didn't care. So I think Bessie Coleman was a woman of incredible integrity and incredible determination and really went the hero's journey in a way that I think few of us would be able to do. And I, I, I don't know, I don't know um, how this happened, but my, I remember my grandmother having a signed photograph from Betsy Coleman. And I, I don't know the con. And we want a copy of it. <laughs> well, I, you know, my, my grandmother passed away several years ago, but I'm going to reach out to um, my uncle um, and see if he can, can, can give me the story. Cause I want to say, and I, I, because when the story was told to me, I was a very small boy. And I remember seeing the photograph and was framed. And um, my grandmother was saying that she was, in fact, a distant relative. But I don't know, I don't remember the, the, the context to it. But I do remember seeing the, the framed autograph photograph. And um, it was in front of her plane. It was it was an amazing thing. I never forgot it. Did, did someone else want to add on to uh, Betsy's story? Lamar, I mean Kevin. Uh, just a, a small thing. What is interesting to me, again, uh, sort of speaking in terms of context. Uh, I'm an immigrant, I'm from Zimbabwe and immigrated to Canada when I was very young. And I can't imagine, a lot of times, you know, it, we can never imagine what comes along with the immigrant's journey, right? With, in terms of not having any support when you get on the other side, not knowing anyone on the other side, oftentimes you don't speak the language, oftentimes you don't know the culture, you may come from another culture where you are a doctor and a pharmacist and all of, you know, and are accredited and then come here and have to start from the beginning being a janitor at a high school. So just contextually for Betsy Coleman to add, having to leave America in the late, in the twenties and pick up in France, in a completely different universe in terms of persevering in her quest. I mean, I think it, you know, those are the, those are the qualities and flavors that, that lift, you know, the courage in these stories for me. Powerful, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. So- um, I should add one last thing is, the Bessie Coleman Aero Club was started after Bessie Coleman died and Banning was the chief instructor there. He was also the vice president of it. So she didn't just inspire this, she inspired Banning who inspired the Tuskegee Airmen. So her legacy oh, wow. is, is incredibly powerful. Lamar. And, and just, just to, uh, to tag on to, uh, to what Luis had just said, I mean, learning, I, I learned about, when I, once I learned about Bessie Coleman, then I started to learn that there were Tuskegee Air women. You know, there are so many, there, there's so many women's stories. Then I know that there were baseball leagues that were all women, that, that we also had the Negro leagues, but they were all baseball leagues, all black women, you know, playing in those leagues. So the Bessie Coleman story just took me down, you know, uh, a hole that it just, I, I was able to learn about more 
prominent black African American women, you know, and that, that that's why just a, a name or or a quote, like we quote William Powell in this play, you know, uh, and if somebody was to go on Google William Powell, then they would they would learn information about him, and, and we give them tidbits. I feel like in in this show because it it is we it's about forty five minutes, and it's packed with so much, but we give you so much that you can. You have a, you have enough to to go and Google and research and make sure that you know you are being fed with this history. Now I'm going to um, go ahead, Talat. One quick thing I wanted to say that I had I don't think had been mentioned is that there were talkbacks on the virtual. I don't know if this was done in I'm sure this was done in the room as well, but there were talkbacks with the audience at the end, and and that I think is a really really important part of the process you know, is, is having the experience, then getting to talk to the performers and letting out some of the questions, letting, letting out some of the, some of the wonderings about what they just saw, I think is super important. Like, how did they do that? Or who was Powell? Or, you know, those kinds of questions would come up if I'm not mistaken. Very powerful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you all so much for sharing. Now I'm going to ask you something. It, it might make you a little uncomfortable, but I think it's important. And there is a method to my madness, believe it or not. So I'm going to ask you right now, I want you to separate yourselves from greatest stories ever told, never told, and tell me something that you're doing that doesn't have anything to do, um, be it theater or movies or TV series or anything like that. Can you just quickly just share anything that you might be doing right now? Wait, do you mean that has nothing to do with the arts or it can be something to do with the arts is not with greatest stories? Not to do with greatest stories. Um, I'm actually just finished a novel that I'm getting ready for submission about a foster child, um, which I think is, I discovered that over a hundred and some thousand kids are lost in the foster care system. Siblings are separated and never found again for each other. And so it became this thing where I wanted to write this story, but I'm also doing, and we just finished the beginning of it. It's called The Strange Birds of Pumpernickel Street. It's for fourth graders. It's about these three girls who go on different adventures and solve problems. And everybody in the town, it's a very multicultural, very diverse town with all these funky, crazy people. And that has just been joy. That has not been work. The amount of research we had to do only depends on our senses of humor because I'm working with two other authors on it. So I'm kind of just loving that, just having fun. Thank you for that, Kevin. Oh, um, I have um, recuperating from surgery. So I have been enjoying just geeking out and, Got a new keyboard, a new base. I've been downloading software for the last three days straight. <laughs> so I'm always heavily involved in my music, which is a lifesaver for me. Um, I'm working with the singer Omar from the UK and the director Che Walker. He has a one man show that he does on piano. And we have been figuring out how I will do that show here, but sort of the American version of their show. So that's been creeping and crawling slowly. And um, I'm slated to be working at Arena Stage this fall doing seven guitars, but I may have to drop out to do a film. So I find out about that tomorrow. So there's enough stuff to keep me busy. I'm still working on the walk. Kevin, right now. Kevin isn't there something <laughs> about a, a Netflix series? Something about Oh my God. Yeah, see, yeah, this is me. Classic. That that green's a little too big, Andy. Yeah, I'm working. Uh, I have a, a series out right currently right now called Hit and Run on Netflix. Um, and it's a uh, an international thriller that starts off in Israel and um, ends up in New York. I play Detective Newkirk, who is the man trying to uh, unravel the international mystery got my own badge, got my own gun, I have my own coat and I have my own fedora and I'm up in there solving crimes. So it's it's been really great. It's been a lot of fun and the response globally has been really fantastic. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Kevin. Dr. Clark, you have a question. No, I wanted to mention that uh, my wife and I 
saw the whole series hit and run and it, it was totally engaging and really amazing and uh kevin looked a lot older in the show i don't know if he's discovered the fountain of youth or <laughs> whether it's a, a good makeup and and wardrobe department that made him look like, like uh, shooting at three in the morning and then shooting at three in the morning <laughs> <laughs> okay lamar Oh man, I just want to say, I mean, I didn't know you were in hit and run, man. Okay, once I finished watching, and I, I didn't know. Once I finished watching Manifest, I'm, I'm, I got I'm gonna get over there. Don't worry, but I got because I got to get through it. Um, I'm not, I'm chilling, man. I'm um, uh, next next week, uh, an episode. Well, my first episode, of Law and Order: Organized Crime, drops. Uh, it'll be out on NBC, 10 p.m. I have a couple episodes. Uh, on this season and um just you know auditioning and, and and staying ready for the next for the next leg of the journey you know and is there something about some show on epic network or something? <laughs> right. i'll tell you you ask questions but you know answers man oh, i'm sorry <laughs> um i just i just uh i worked on season two of, i was recurring on season two of godfather of harlem uh it's on epics i got to work with with uh forest whitaker you know it's a a legend so you know i'm just forever indebted for that opportunity and um you know like i said man it's just uh taking them as they come okay so the reason why i i asked you you three that that question is because you do not have to work on telling the story of greatest stories never told. You have the ability to walk completely away. You don't have to do it. It's not something that you have to do. And those who are listening, I want you to understand that they're making a choice. They're making a commitment to do something that they don't have to. That's what I want you to know. They're intentional in wanting this story to be told. And that's why I asked them to share that because I want you to know that they are in fact doing as the young people say, extra. They're doing extra because they want this story or these stories to be told. So I wanna say again to each of you, thank you so much for doing this. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say there's one question from YouTube that we, that we missed um, that I put okay. in Makana and I was hoping we can get that in before we end here. All right. And that question comes from Carissa Worthy. Have you found during your research that history may be repeating itself? If so, how? And she says, thanks. Um, I think that history has a terrible habit of repeating itself. And I think that's why we need to tell these stories just so we can help that not happen. Um, do I think that there is a deep, like the Jim Crow laws, do I think they still exist? Yes, I really do believe they do. They've changed their form, they have a different name, but they still do exist. And I think it's one of the reasons why telling these stories is so important. So maybe we can change it. So maybe we don't repeat ourselves over and over again. Maybe we can actually value what our real history is and all the people that make up this country that's so diverse and wonderful. Like they say, diversity is health. It's really true. Without diversity, we are not a healthy society. That's true in the mammal world. That's true with any of the living beings on this planet. Diversity is health. And so I think that's really an important part of this. I think one of the Thank things we have to look at is for uh, that I look at in terms of history repeating itself um, on a very basic and simple level is the is fundamental pushback. 
we have we came through an era where we had Barack Obama as a president. It is not a surprise that we had pushback and had tribalist right activity pushing back against progress in that way. So we have these two gentlemen trying to fly across the country, this pushback in terms of getting our licenses. And, and I think that that is when we encounter that kind of resistance, I think our first impulse oftentimes is to almost gaslight ourselves, right? Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not worthy you know, and sort of accept that as opposed to saying, maybe I'm actually making ground and this pushback is in response to the fact that I have affected something or I'm making ground. That's a very difficult thing to take on individually, right? So I always look for where the pushback is because it's usually indicative of some kind of progress. And I think that that's, to me, that is the kind of history that I see consistently repeating itself, whether it is Jim Crow laws after reconstruction, whether it's redlining, whether it is the events in Tulsa and other cities, you know, whether it is taking what was a successful cash crop for, uh, coming out of reconstruction for African-American freed farmers, the watermelon, and then turning that into some twisted, um, symbol of racism and bigotry mainly because of an economic drive amongst other white farmers who were facing competition you know pushback to me is always very essential to see where it, it pushback to me follows second behind follow the money and just just really just really quick um i believe history would actually repeat itself more if more of us knew our history because we would know some of the great things that we do that we've done that our ancestors have done and we would just take those and build upon it or do it again and just reinvent it but history repeating itself cannot cannot be the worst thing if we know what we're repeating and we're doing it purposely you know purposefully so I, I i don't mind it but if as long as we know and we're moving forward knowledgeably so that's that's all i have to say to that wow thank you thank you thank you again so much everyone for for being here and so before we have final words from our guests we're going to ask the other panelists to to share their their final words so we're going to start with andy well, again, I just want to echo incredible thanks to having you here today and for doing what you're doing. Um, the thing that has resonated most with me, um, truly from the time that we met and began working together, is the tenacity at which you attack the telling of these stories. Um, it's one thing to sort of just, you know, throw up a blog post or whatever and say, hey, here's this thing. I'm putting some light on it. I'm putting, I'm kind of putting it out there. But you guys wake up every single day and think about, what is not, not only what I'm doing now, but what can I do tomorrow and the day after that? And how can I push this forward? And so I think that that, you know, that drive is such a rare thing, but when applied to this um, incredible need in our society and in education to, again, understand that history in that context, so grateful that you guys have that energy and that you're, you're pedal to the metal on this and that you're constantly thinking of how to innovate and how to make it better and how to get it more widely disseminated and, huge respect for that and for taking the really brave step of mounting this online, um, which a lot of people can't do. And you guys attack that problem every single day and work through it and you made it work. So I'm really uh, appreciative of you and of your tenacity. Thank you, Andy. Dr. Clark. I was going to say everything that Andy said, uh, but not as well. But I wanted to add a few highlights of things I learned in the last hour. Uh, when Lamar was talking about uh, the engagement of school kids in, in solving these math problems in their heads and so forth, it occurred to me that um, the reason they were so engaged is that these are life and death equations. If you miscalculate the amount of fuel that you've got, to the next airport, um, it could end badly. So it wasn't fake word problems we're dealing with here. This, these 
students you were working with and teaching were really engaged in the in the drama and the necessity of solving these problems uh, in a with a different motive than getting a good grade or finishing the homework. So I, I love this idea of life and death equations. Um, and I'm, I imagine Lamar probably uses some expression like that uh, in his presentation. Uh, to zoom back a little bit, I wanted to talk about um, your process of continuously examining how well you engaged with the audience and how you use the talk back sessions to um, revise and improve and fine tune the way that you make these live presentations. Uh, it's called action research in my field of education, where you you act and then you study how you acted and what the results were and how it could have been a little bit better and change one or two things and and try to improve the impact or the engagement or whatever your your measure of effectiveness is. So um, you guys are already halfway through a doctoral program in both education and in history. I'm going to see what I can do to get uh, honorary degrees spread around among uh, the people we've met tonight. And you probably have nominations of other colleagues who weren't able to be with us tonight. And then I just love the idea. Again, I think Lamar is the one who articulated it, but everybody was nodding their head of continuous learning, that this isn't just a performance where you learn your lines and you repeat another opening, another show, but you are so clearly uh, engaged in learning about the history of America, the history of these heroes who are unsung at this point. Um, and that's, that's what's going to keep you young. That's, that's why Kevin looks so young. It's because of continuous learning. That's, that would be my, my compliment and my prescription for continuing to have long, successful, and happy lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. To luck. So I think one of the things that I, I absolutely love about this group and about this conversation is that it highlights the fact that what the arts can do is combine the liberal arts, the, his, the history, the science, all of that, combine it into something that sparks the desire to know more. And so, you know, when people are working on ways to teach people, remember that the glue that holds it all together is engagement. And those of us that are in the arts try to engage people. And when we try to engage people, we can pull out people who are interested in aviation, people who are interested in, in science, people who are interest, interested in history, people who are interested in acting, people who are interested in technology that we've just used in order to get, get that particular show to, to that person. And so the talk back becomes important because then, you know, uh, a particular student might say, how did you do that? Or where did you get that information? And so what ends up potentially happening is that they're gonna go look for more information and they're gonna start to study it themselves. Thank you for that. So uh, Lamar, we're gonna have your final words. Oh, uh, I would say that the one of the reasons, there's so many reasons, but one of the reasons, uh, I will continue to stay with greatest stories ever told and tell as many stories as I can because it's because this, this space allows me to do all the things that I want to do with my art. And that's inspire, empower, enlighten, and educate. Those are the four things in every prayer that I say and every time that I get ready to do any type of performance or whatever it is, those are the four things I set out to do to any audience or anybody who's coming to experience my art. And if and by me doing something that I'm passionate about, which is telling my history, I know that this story is effective because it affects me every time I'm able to, you know, tell it to someone else. So inspire, enlighten, educate, empower. And that's it, that's what the story does. Wow, thank you for that. 
Louisa. I just want the honorary degree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's, I think stories, especially true stories that are grounded in the truth are magical. And they take us places we couldn't go any other way. And this story not only helps us see some real heroes, but it also answers the question, why do we need science and why do we do math? Well, we do it because it's part of our lives. It's not over here. It's part of our daily lives and being able to do those at a very, at a, at a higher level really helps us in our world. Um, but I think the biggest reason to tell these stories is my grandson, after we did some filming with Lamar and Gentil, actually looked up at me and said, and he loves to invent things that, by the way, explode. But he's, he said, I'm a lot like Banning. And that was when I made that conscious decision that I was going to tell this story. I wanted a million kids. I wanted 10 million kids. I wanted every kid out there to be able to say they were a lot like Banning. If that's where their drive and their motivation was, I wanted to be a part of creating something that helped them feel that. So to be honest, this has been an act of passion and love for my grandchildren that's become an act of passion and love for the generations that are here now and the generations that are coming. Thank you, Louisa. Kevin? And Louisa has not mentioned her book, Sprouting Wings, about this journey about James Irvin Banning that's doing great, uh, uh, beautiful um, illustrations as well by Floyd Cooper, who we just lost, a true African-American artist and master. So that's I'm very glad that she got to do that and got to do it with him. Um, part of the reason I think that I will always continue to do work like this. Um, my parents were both in the medical field. They were both teachers as well. From a very young age, my dad told me, once you stop learning, you die. <laughs> he was a coroner, so I believed him. Um, while we are, most of us, particularly living in, in New York City or in some of these other artistic communities, working for wages, we're not making money hand over fist. And oftentimes you, you're in the middle of a job and sometimes you are fortunate to be enriched in doing a job that has a bigger reach than just entertainment value. I've been very lucky in my career to do work like that. Um, so I've always been drawn to teaching and fixing and therefore, and writing and creating and therefore by extension, directing. And to be able to take the things that I'm doing that I love and that I was put here to do and be able to synthesize this into a service of giving and teaching and really create synthesis where they are synthesized what it's the kind of journey that does not have to, to end. It will always be evolving. It will always be growing. There will always be learning. There will always be teaching. There will always be exchange and it will always be collaborative. I'm a big believer in additive principles. And even looking at the panel that's in front of me, we are greater together than the sum of our parts. That is always something that excites me about working on things like this with teams. So I will, I will always give my time to this kind of work, always. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you again. Uh, wow, wow, and wow, and wow, again. Guys, thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here. I, I cannot thank you enough for being here. And I can go on and on with my thanks, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to apologize before I give my thanks to everyone that's a part of conversation with Tony Mobley and those that are working in front of the camera and those that are working behind the camera. I typically leave someone off, but I'm gonna do my very best to try to get all the names right this time. So we're gonna start with a special thanks to Kimberly Mobley, the Global Family and Friends, Alex Lindsay and the Office Hours members, DVE Store, Liminal Entertainment Technologies, 
Bite Hive or Beehive, uh, Video360, ApprovedForLoan.com, Talak Lopez Waterman, Mr. Ken Jordan, Aaron Huge, uh, Chirak Chita, Jonas Detail, Mark Lee Folk, Marcus Lee Folk, Richard Lavery, Chris Fenwick, Manolo Lozano, Jeffrey Powers. And I want to say thank you all for watching. Um, those who are watching the the rebroadcast on YouTube, I ask that you like and subscribe. We want to, you know, do do a better job of, of sharing with everyone these great conversations that we're having. I am I am thankful for for this conversation tonight because it encourages me to encourage others to think about um, uh, young people paying more attention to math and science and 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 the uh, the importance of knowing your history. Coming next week, we're going to have a conversation around mental health. And I have two therapists that are on board to help me in that conversation. And that's uh, Carla Hawkins and Ernest Benson. They will be on next week with me and we'll be talking about mental health. And also we have some very interesting conversations coming very soon. Education for educators, filmmakers, musicians. And we have more interesting conversations with more interesting people coming soon. So I want to again, thank everyone so much for being here. I want to thank you all for participating in this great conversation. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, special guests, so much for being here. And we're going to say good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>